Hello and welcome to the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. My name is Dr. Roger K. Green. I am the founder of the Center. This video is going to be a beginning to an ongoing question about what critical theory means today. I'm going to give some broad background and history that I'll fill in in various other lectures. And part of my project here is really to take an assessment of what has happened in the past century um, around this discourse called critical theory. Um, and through that assessment to take a look at what we might do in the next century or in our current era uh, with this discourse that emerged uh, in the 1920s. So let me dig in here. For people new to the idea of, of discourse around this concept of critical theory, um, uh, especially in a broad mediatized culture that demonizes things like critical race theory, uh, which is different from critical theory that as I'm uh, posing it here, uh, but might be relevant in a later or different lecture. For people new to the idea and discourse around critical theory, one of the main differences between theory and everyday thinking is that uh, critical theory takes as a premise that the object of theorizing is socially derived and not merely the individual's subjective feelings. So when we are looking at things, when we are theorizing, we're theorizing at something uh, broader than just a particular group or a particular individual's feelings. And it necessitates a certain amount of generalizing. Um, and uh, hopefully there are other, you know, uh, pieces of evidence to back up uh, the kinds of theory that there are uh, is a kind of phenomenological matching between what is being theorized and what is being felt. It doesn't necessarily be, need to be felt by everyone always at the same time, though. So uh, it won't necessarily necessarily speak to every single individual's existential condition. Uh, still, uh, it might at times speak to a certain swath of people's existential conditions, such as when we're dealing with something like critical race theory. Uh, uh, we might be more attentive to specific groups and around uh, who. Uh, formulate around identity claims around something like race, right? Uh, uh, but but that is only one sort of area. Uh, so uh, I want to resist, first of all, the idea that we can sort of have a theory of everything right off the bat. Uh, and at the same time, uh, note that it's an important thing to be able to do this thing called critical theory. Um, uh, so we're going for more than people's subjective feelings, but we're not quite making the grand claim that we know uh, everything about how the universe works and everything about how every society works and everything about uh, what it might mean to be living and thinking and doing critical theory in Denver, Colorado, where I am right now, versus doing critical theory uh, in uh, the jungles of Colombia right now, for example. Okay, so th there will be nuances and differences that we need to take account of. Uh, so from the perspective of critical theory, one's own affective states, my own emotional states, my internalized emotions um, are not just my internalized emotions, though, that they, they are derived from social conditions outside of us. And you might notice, for example, that in the United States today, whether uh, you are consider yourself on the left or the right or apolitical, that there is a lot of anger right now, right? That that anger, so a critical theory position on that anger would be to assess it in terms of, of something happening at the social level or the societal level um, across a shared culture. 
um, even though you might have very contested positions and perspectives and politics within that cultural matrix. So what is it that drives the angst and anger, frustration? Um, could be a large amount of things. Could be economic, could be uh, have to do with class tensions, race tensions, gender, you name it. There might be lots of different ex tools for explanation. The idea right now is just that what critical theory does is it looks broader than one's own individual state and one's own particular family relations maybe. Um, although we might take for sure um, class relations and historical uh, conditions that allow certain groups to um, dominate other groups into account. So critical theory, as I'm getting at, is constantly in flux. And so far as it tries to keep account of present conditions, and what one theorist uh, named Walter Benjamin, German theorist, uh, called presence of mind. Now, Benjamin, or Benjamin, it's okay if you say his name the American style, uh, Walter Benjamin's statement was made with respect to um, the Marxian uh, thought or a Marxian revolution in mind. So what does he mean there, a presence of mind? Why does he have it as the Marxian revolution? Well, you might think of a film like uh, um, Sergei Eisenstein's 1925 film Battleship Potemkin. Um, which was a Soviet film. It was uh, celebrating in many ways um, the Russian Revolution in the late 19 teens at the end of World War I. And what becomes after this revolution, uh, the Soviet Union, which lasts through most of the 20th century until the final breakup in 1991. Um, set history aside for a second here and just think about the film which you can usually find on youtube you can watch it for free it's a silent film and it um is really important in film history um outside of whatever politics it's saying it's an important film to know about uh, but the film depicts uh the people sort of rising up and overthrowing uh, the, the people in charge. And the way that it shows this gets at this thing that Benjamin was talking about. Um, because it doesn't happen that there's just like one person calling out um, and spreading the word um, or that there's a chain of command uh, at work in, in this kind of a revolution. There seems to be something intersubjective that pervades many people's dispositions so that they all start acting at once without any particular person guiding them. Uh, kind of think think about it like the French um, a resistance during World War II. Uh, I, I knew a, a, a man who's now passed away, uh, sadly, who was a member of the French resistance when he was young and his brothers were uh, all members of the French resistance. But they, when, you know, he would tell me uh, when he was alive that there was no one person or no, like the, the, the there, no one knew really who was in charge. Everybody just knew that their country was being invaded and there was this alliance that had developed as the resistance and there wasn't as necessarily a center or a head to it there was a feeling across um, a lot of different individuals that were going to say no we won't let the nazis take us over right so uh, that's a little bit more what benjamin is getting at when he says that we need to have this thing called presence of mind we have to have an awareness of the changing situations. Now, Benjamin, like many critical theorists of this early era, was Jewish as well. And Jewish people, having dealt with a thousand years at this point of, of uh, persecution in Europe, uh, uh, based on, um, you might think, their religion at first, but um, Nazi policy against Jewish people was racial. Right, so it's important to think that this is not just a discrimination in terms of religion, although that 
definitely came from Christians earlier on, uh, uh, um, but it was uh, Jewish people as a race. So it was a form of racism, the extermination or the, att the attempt to exterminate Jews in Eastern Europe during World War II. Uh, a persecuted people needs to have um, a sense of what's going on, right? Reading the news, uh, paying attention to politics, because their condition as Jewish people meant that they were constantly under threat, even if they were secularized, even if they spoke the highest German, uh, were highly educated. None of this seemed to matter when anti-Semitism and Nazism rose up, right? So uh, think about what it might mean then to uh, pay, have your ears out, to be attentive to the conditions, because the cr early critical theorists um, who were mostly Jewish, as I've said, had to flee the Nazis, right? So uh, um, the question of any revolution has to do with a spark or an intersubjective affective wave, I'll call it. By affect, I'm thinking about like emotion, right? So as the Invisible Committee put it in their 2007 book in English uh, called The Coming Insurrection, um, they use this term affective wave. Uh, so the Invisible Committee is an, an anonymous kind of collective of people more recent than the earlier critical theorists that I've already mentioned. Uh, and they've released several um, books and writings. Uh, and they I'll say more about them in a little bit, but um, they're quite interesting in their book, The Coming Insurrection, because they've kind of predicted some of the um, violence that's happened politically in the United States in recent years. Um, so they're a, um, a, a good source for at least starting to think about some of these issues. Um, back to critical theory more broadly and in the earlier moment, um, critical theory is always paying attention to the ephemeral, um, to the daily changing conditions inherited or inherently um, uh, uh, working throughout society, but also critical theory is attempting to resist the grand theorizing of metaphysical claims about the nature of the cosmos um, and uh, um, the nature of reality as such, right? Um, social reality is in flux. There isn't a one size all fit, um, uh, a one size fits all theory that uh, is going to account for everything. So uh, uh, it, it pushes back against um, uh, some sorts of philosophical claims that might try to do that type of, of work. Although I will say that some recent critical theory has embraced uh, it um, mathematical ideas such as string theory and um, interdimensionality or post-humanism. There's a lot of strains of current thought um, that do uh, take into account the kinds of things that the hard sciences have figured out about the nature of the universe in the past hundred years as well. Really important thing to think about, and I will stress over and over again, things have changed in the past hundred years. Things have changed since this guy, Marx. Um, so critical theory is processual, though at times it takes on it ha or has taken on descriptions through what I will call structural critique or structuralism. Early critical theorists were associated with the Institute for Social Research, also known as the Frankfurt School, which was founded in 1923 in Frankfurt, Germany, um, and initially directed by a guy named Karl Grunberg. The Frankfurt School was a loose affiliation of social theorists committed to Marxian theory and analysis. As time went on, however, they developed on Marx to include a form of cultural critique. So this might be a kind of neo-Marxism. Largely made up of Jewish intellectuals, the Institute had to flee Germany and eventually all of Europe with the rise of Hitler's na Nazism. 
eventually finding partnership with Columbia University in New York City in 1934. Many of those affiliated would then become important figures in American universities or just uh, in um, scholarly thought throughout the, um, um, the United States. So while Marxist thought remained important to them, um, these early theorists, and he's, his thought remains important today, I will say that he's important today, the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory that I have initiated We'll come back to Marx often, but it's also really important from the beginning to note that a lot has changed in the past century. Besides the dogmatic vilification or demonizing of Marx in broader US discourse due to the long shadow of Cold War politics and the failed attempts at communism in the 20th century, so things like the Soviet Union, <laughs> um, a certain nostalgia has developed by a lot of people who traditionally identify with leftism or pro-labor activism. Now, I'm not going to say that it's just it's wrong to be into those things at all, um, but there's a kind of uh, preformed identity category, um, almost like becoming a punk rocker. Like it's like, okay, now I'm going to become a punk rocker and I'm going to dress a certain way. I'm going to become an anarchist. And there's all of the trappings that I have when I'm an anarchist or when I'm a Marxist. I am going to resist those types of aesthetic impulses that have become codified in my culture. Um, uh, because I think that they push us towards unthought and away from where critical theory needs to be today. Uh, although I am not saying that one should not engage in pro-labor activism uh, at all. I'm just not characterizing my project in critical theory here as inherently tied to that, um, uh, the, uh, the trappings that get um, uh, stereotypically aligned with an older notion of the left. Uh, the position of the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory will resist nostalgic sentiment for prefabricated Marxist identities and instead focus heavily on the changes and conditions over the last century that make doing critical theory today a different project. By the early 1930s, with the rise of Hitlerism, critical theorists early on were grappling with and trying to understand why the economic situation in Germany um, uh, uh, following the the uh, the market crash of or uh, the market crashing of the late 1920s did not result in a Marxian revolution. So that's where the classic critical theorists of the Frankfurt School start is I mean they'd already started by the 1920s when like early 1920s when uh, Germany's economy was devastated after the Treaty of Versailles in 1919 and after the imposition of liberal democracy onto Germany. And so there's all sorts of different conversations going on in that period that we will return to in various different lectures at the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. Uh, it's important to hear what the right wing people were saying then. It's important to hear what the left wing people were saying there then and the people who were calling themselves liberals or supporters of liberalism who saw themselves as a kind of center, but that was also uh, put onto Germany from outside um, forces that had been successful at the end of World War I. Uh, because of those conditions uh, not working out, we get later World War II. So it's important to understand the various perspectives. And we will sometimes have to talk about um, right wing folks at the Center for Critical Theory and left wing folks at the Center for Critical Theory and liberals um, or liberalism or what we might call more recently neoliberalism, because that's really the kind of formation of what's starting to happen in the late 1930s as the as the kind of middle way between the further right and left wing politics that arise. Um, we will need to account for all of these things and, and, and have some, some conceptions. The Center for Critical and Cultural Theory is not at this point in time 
necessarily aligning with any of those three things. My own perspective, the perspective of the center will take on uh, attributes of all sorts of folks who are coming in to speak and do uh, um, uh, projects with the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. Um, so it can't just be my own personal politics as the director. Um, and they will formulate, we will have a sense of that. But from the beginning, I will just say, just for it to, to at the outset here, I want to resist the codification of the classic Marxist theorists, certainly the far right theorists. Um, I will say that I'm not far right. Um, that is not my intention here. Um, uh, and and the, the so-called centrists or the liberals. So uh, that said, the early critical theorists were trying to understand, like, it seemed like from the way Marx had described things, that there was going to be a revolution. And so why, at the end of the 1920s, why didn't Germany join the Soviet Union? That was one of the questions that they were trying to deal with. Instead, Germany went further right. Instead of to the left, they went further right. Um, not right away, but through the emergent populism surrounding the National Socialist Party. And then what resulted from that was Hitler claiming absolute power in 1933, right? So, so it starts as a populist movement um, among a various different movements in Germany and then becomes this dictatorial regime. So, uh, the critical theorists are trying to say, they're really asking in the early era, like what went wrong with Marxian theory? Um, so to just call them Marxists from the right off, it's like, well, that doesn't quite get at, you know, what they were doing. <laughs> um, so uh, something um, was missing in what uh, was called Ma Marxian dialectical thinking, which I'll talk about in a minute here. And uh, they decided collectively, and not just in one particular piece, but uh, over um, the next 15 years or so, they decided that they what one of the things missing in original Marxian thinking was a, a, a robust account of culture. And so they turn their sights towards cultural critique. So much of the theoretical work of the next 50 years or so from critical theorists was dealing with that issue of how do we do something like cultural critique. And that is one of the main changes that happens between 1923 and 2023, right? Uh, is all of this robust inquiry into what it means to account for cultural products, um, for aesthetics, uh, for uh, media and new media, all of that stuff is what is kind of taking place. Um, and critical theorists have been trying to keep up with those changes for the past hundred years. So it's resulted in a completely, what I will say, different project in the, in the 2020s uh, when I'm making this video. So uh, I'm going to be exploring and the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory, the reason why it's critical and cultural theory, as you, now you maybe can guess, is that I'm trying to account for that past century of thought. So there will be a lot of backwards uh, or historical looking. Um, we will definitely move further back than the 20th century, but that is my main background uh, as, as a thinker and as a scholar. So I will be speaking to those issues quite a bit in my lectures. So let's go right now um, and uh, we will dive into some background. I'm going to make uh, a break in this particular video uh, and just remind us that what we're doing in critical theory in 2022 is different, according to my account, um, from the Center for Critical and Cultural Theory. And the main difference right now is that uh, 
Over the past hundred years, critical theorists moved from Marxian critique to a critique of culture to account for gaps or things that did not work well in a dialectical thinking of Marx. Um, and that expanded into various different threads and discourses. Uh, the idea was to account for aesthetics, for art, for culture, and for new means of communicating across various different media. Those are the big, big picture things that make doing critical theory today different than in the past. I'm going to stop here and then pick up with uh, part two of this, or what is critical theory in the 21st century, part two, uh, in another video. Thank you for watching this initial one.